Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the eighth session of Ocean Acidification Week 2020, a virtual multi-day forum to highlight ocean acidification research and initiatives. OA Week is presented by GOAN, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, by NOAA, the no National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, by the IAEA OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center, and by the IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. This session will feature talks from the countries that surround the Northeast Atlantic Ocean. We were pleased to see that over 170 people pre-registered for today's session. Currently, there are 55 people on the webinar, and we hope that the rest will join very soon. My name is Michael Aquafreda, and I work with the GOAN Secretariat. I'm also a Knauss Fellow working with the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. I'll be moderating today's session. During the presentation, all participants are in listen-only mode. You are welcome to type any questions into the questions box, which can be found at the bottom of the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. You can also pose questions and share your insights on Twitter using the hashtag OAWeek2020. We do ask that you specify the speaker you're directing your questions to. We'll be moderating incoming questions and we'll pose them to our speakers during the question and answer section, which will be immediately after the last presentation finishes. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available through the Go On YouTube channel shortly after OA Week ends. Before we hear from our speakers, I'd like to share a brief presentation about Go On. GOAN is a collaborative international network designed to address three high-level goals. First, to improve our understanding of global ocean acidification conditions. Second, to improve our understanding of ecosystem response to OA. Third, to acquire and exchange data and knowledge necessary to optimize modeling for OA and its impacts. GOAN is an active organization that offers numerous resources to its members. GOAN informs policy at the international level. GOAN is involved with the Commonwealth Blue Charter and the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, um, 2021 to 2030. More specifically, GOAN also assisted with the UN Sustainable Development Goal 14 by developing uh, the methodology for SDG Indicator 14.3.1 by providing guidance on how to measure ocean acidity and how to report the collected information. GOAN also offers a scientific mentorship program through the Peer-to-Peer -peer Network. Peer-to-Peer -peer matches senior researchers with early career scientists to facilitate an exchange of expertise and to provide a platform for international collaborations. Scholarships and hands-on trainings are available through Peer-to-Peer. -peer. GOAN also hosts a data portal, which provides access and visualization to OA data and data synthesis products being collected around the world. Data are present from a wide range of sources, including moorings, research cruises, and fixed time series stations. Finally, and most recently, GOAN's newest resource is a webinar series. In fact, Ocean Acidification Week 2020 is the kickoff to this new GOAN webinar series. Future webinars will take place every four to six weeks. We welcome your input on what topics you would like to hear about in future GOAN webinars. If you have any ideas, please type them into the the questions box at any time during today's presentation. GOAN has eight regional hubs and we'll be hearing from most of them throughout Ocean Acidification Week. Overall, GOAN has over 750 members from over 100 countries. Join GOAN today by visiting goon.org. One reason why GOAN de decided to host Ocean Acidification Week is because initially the fifth international symposium on the ocean in a high CO2 world was scheduled to take place this week in Lima, Peru. Yet like many other events scheduled for this year, the symposium had to be postponed until 2021 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. This symposium would have brought together researchers, decision makers, and other stakeholders to share cutting edge ocean acidification science. We're looking forward to that, and we hope everyone listening today will visit the symposium's website and learn more. See you in Lima in 2021. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers for session eight, the Northeast Atlantic Hub part two. This session is focused mostly on uh, biological activities 
um, and the impacts OA has on um, ecosystems and organisms. The first talk will be um, presented by Eve Oltjax from Portugal. Next, we have Sam Dupont from Sweden. Next, we have Kelsey Archer Barnhill from the UK. We'll then be hearing from Jason Hall Spencer, also from the UK. And finally, we'll be hearing from Silvana Birkenuff, also from the UK. But before we hear from them, I'd like to give a little bit more information about the Northeast Atlantic Hub. And to do that, I would like to introduce Helen Finley, a co-chair of the Northeast Atlantic Hub. Helen, would you please unmute yourself and uh, take it away? Thank you, Mike. Um, yes, welcome to this session, second session for the Northeast Atlantic Asian Acidification Hub. This hub was formed in around about November 2018, so we're only a couple of years old. Um, it's coordinated here at Plymouth Marine Laboratory by myself, Helen Finley, and Steve Widdicombe, um, with financial support from the UK government. We were able to hold our first workshop in March 2019. Um, we were hoping to have another one this year. Unfortunately, COVID has prevented that. But we are having quarterly executive group meetings and taking um, our aims forward um, through virtual activities. We currently have over 80 members from 13 countries in the Northeast Atlantic region um, with over 78 monitoring activities and assets that include things like fixed point mon monitoring, um, cruises and ongoing activities. Uh, these are the, this ranges from relatively new uh, activities, um, but also we have some long-term time series spanning back to the 1990s um, and going forward. So the aims of the hub are really to share knowledge. Um, the regions are, are all relatively different across the world. The, the aim of our hub is to bring together our expertise um, knowledge and exchange data, as well as bring our community together to facilitate uh, greater ambition for um, solutions and solving and helping to mitigate um, and take action against ocean acidification. So without further ado, um, we'll crack on with the second session. This session, as Mike said, is really to do with the second aims of GOAN, um, which is the improve the understanding of ecosystems um, that uh, may be vulnerable or perhaps resilient to ocean acidification, um, quantifying change, identifying um, organisms and tracking biological responses. So I'll hand over to Mike and our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that overview of the Northeast Atlantic Hub, Helen. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Eve Oltjox. Eve, I've now made you the panelist. You could go ahead and start sharing your screen and unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay. I hope that everything is working. Yeah, we can see your PowerPoint presentation in full screen, which is great. Um, and we also could hear you loud and clear. Eve, you could take it away. Oh. Thank you, and thank you for this opportunity to present our latest work, published actually this summer in biology, so with the cuttlefish buoyancy in uh, response to food availability and ocean acidification. So first, a really quick uh, introduction. Um, so um, oceans are in gas equilibrium with the atmosphere, absorbing around 30% of the emitted CO2. This CO2 will combine with the seawater forming carbonic acids and which associates after, uh, afterwards into bicarbonate and free hydrogen ions. In normal times, the carbonate ions present in the water will only react a little with those hydrogen uh, ions to form bic bicarbonate. And most of it will actually be available for the calcifying marine organisms such as corals, mollusks. However, since the Industrial Revolution, increase in the emission of CO2 is imbalancing these reactions towards an increase of hydrogen and a decrease of the sea water pH, the process known as ocean acidification. Uh, this process and the emission of CO2 are expecting, expected to get worse until the, the end of the century. And this does not only affect the pH, but also the availability of the carbonate. Since um, 
the hydrogen will be more present. It will actually react more with the carbonates uh, and reducing its availability for uh, the calcifying, calcifying marine organisms, which will impact them greatly. Um, and that is one of the focus of the research I will present to you today, since it can also impact cuttlefish and uh, their cattle bone. Indeed, it was shown that um, cattle bone had an increase of mineralization of carbonate calcium, and the cattle bone then get more dense than in controlled conditions uh, under high CO2. But since cattle bone are used to regulate the buoyancy of cuttlefish, one question arises. What about the cuttlefish buoyancy? If the cattle bone has its density change under high CO2 conditions, would the buoyancy be affected or not? Alongside with ocean acidification, we also wanted to test the effect of food availability on the buoyancy, since malnutrition also affects the cattle bone structure, and starvation is suggested to lead to more buoyant cuttlefish. So here we actually aim to understand the combined effect of food availability with fed viands non-fed individual and oceanification under control and high CO2 levels on the cuttlefish buoyancy cap capabilities. And we uh, try to explain it with a modification of the cattle bone. To do so, we picked up X clutches from Sado Asturi in Portugal and we brought them to the facility. There, we separated the eggs and individually placed them in vials. And we had two different treatments of water, a control with CO2 level found nowadays and a high CO2 level, which is the level expected of CO2 by the end of the century. We kept the, uh, the eggs in these treatments until hatching and after uh, it was the same treatment for the newborns until sampling. To assess the calcification of the cattle bone, we sampled the cattle fish and their respective uh, cattle bone according to four different sampling endpoints and feeding treatment. First, a sampling endpoint, we sampled the cattle fish as soon as they hatch, up to two days after hatching. Second, the cattle fish were uh, kept after hatching unfed until they started to float and they were sampled at this time. Third, we paired these cuttlefish from the third sampling endpoint with a cuttlefish from the second sampling endpoint. Uh, and in this case, the cuttlefish were fed every day with one live gametes from a stock production present at the facility uh, for the same number of days that it took for the sampling uh, endpoint two cuttlefish to float. Finally, the cuttlefish in these four sampling endpoints were fed every day with one gam gametes for 25 to 30 days, which was a longer time than from the previous sampling endpoints. Of course, if a, if a cuttlefish from the sampling endpoint 3 or 4, even if they were from a fed treatment, started to float nonetheless, they were sampled at that time. Uh, now, once we had the cattle bone, we dried them, took the dry weight and a picture. With this picture, we used, we used this picture to measure the area of the cattle bone to have uh, this weight area ratio for each cattle bone. Now, first, before studying the cattle bone and the combined effect of CO2 and food availability, we wanted to have an idea of the hatching success in our experiment according to the CO2 treatment. It is important to note here that since we had eggs from different clutches, the embryos might have uh, been in different time in their embryonic development. However, they were randomly separated over the different treatments, so it will not affect the results. And what we found here is that there was a significant difference between the treatment over time. First, uh, we saw a delay of three days in hatching time. So when 50% of the hatchings of the cuttlefish, ha of the cuttlefish hatched, the um, hatching success was um, lower and had a delay of three days under high CO2 conditions than in control um, and uh, sorry and the hatching success was lower when cuttlefish spend more time of their uh, embryo development under high CO2 than in co uh, control treatment. So as longer exposed embryos have a lower hatching success under high CO2, we suggest that cuttlefish exposed to ocean acidification at earlier development stages are less tolerant than later stages. Now, although uh, there was an effect of ocean acidification on the hatching success, 
we didn't see any significant alteration of the cattle bone weight area ratio of the hatchlings when exposed to high CO2 before hatching. However, as our weight area ratio is only a rough proxy for calci calcification, we cannot rule out uh, no over calcification and thus an increase in density of the cattle bones as found in previous studies. Actually, we could find uh, differences in the cattle bone weight area ratio in newborns few weeks after hatching. Indeed, if we take into account the food availability with newborn cattlefish, we found a three-way interaction between the CO2, the feeding, and the number of days in treatment after hatching. We can see it clearly here that under high CO2 in red, we have a negative trend over um, time for the cattle bone weight area ratio for non-fed cattlefish, while the slope is actually positive for fed individuals. Next, we looked at the BNC more specifically, where there was no significant differences be, uh, regarding the CO2 treatment. So here between uh, those two lines and those two lines here. But the proportion of floaters was significantly higher when cuttlefish were non-fed, as they all end up floating compared to fed individuals. So although malnutrition was not thought of affecting buoyancy of cuttlefish, we showed here that starvation does. As for the weight area ratio of the cattle bone regarding the buoyancy, we saw using only fed individuals uh, or individuals from fed treatments, a significant difference according to the interaction between CO2 and exposure time. We can see it more clearly here that floater individuals in uh, blue are present actually a lower weight area ratio than non-floater individuals uh, as here under high CO2. It is important to note here as well that this unexpected feature of floating in the fed treatment was associated with the fact that these cuttlefish showed a lack of predatory behavior towards the gametes and were not, thus not actually feeding. Now to summarize the big point of this research, first we found out that hatching success was negatively affected by oceanification, but uh, oceanification did not significantly affect the weight area ratio of the catabon at the hatching time. However, we did find found consistency here compared to other studies where we found this increase in weight area ratio over time under high CO2. However, this was highly dependent on food availability. And finally, the buoyancy of cuttlefish was accepted, affected by the food av availability, but not by oceanification. So with these, we suggest that under CO2, cuttlefish might actually be subject to dissolution effects of the cuttle bone if their food availability is limited, but would be subject to over with a higher availability of food. Which brings me to this take home message that our research shows that it's actually primordial to account for food availability in further research to accurately determine the responses of calcifying organisms to ocean specification and that the usual ad libitum feeding might actually mask potential variation in the effects of ocean specification. So I would like to thank my colleagues and co-author of this research as well as the funding resources and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that presentation, Eve. Uh, if any of the audience members have questions for Eve, uh, please post them in the questions box. At this point, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Sam Dupont. Sam, I've made you the presenter. All right, thank you very much. I hope it's okay. So I'm going to present some, some data that we have collected uh, last year with uh, my, my PhD student, Zamboya, from Mozambique. And we were interested in the role of natural variability on the physiological mechanisms and in particular calcif calcifiers and calcification. So over, over the last 10 years, sea urchins have really been like a top model in, in ocean acidification research. For many reasons, it's ecologically important, but it's also a fantastic model because we have so many, so many tools. And it has been shown a little bit like for cuttlefish in the last presentation that Sam, sorry to interrupt. Um, it looks like we can't see your screen. I'm not sure if you're doing a, a, a prologue or not, but um, why don't you try, try to share your slides first? Okay, that's interesting uh, because I thought, can you see it now? 
Uh, no, we cannot. Okay. Uh, can can you share again? Sure. Because maybe it worked the first time, last time, so. Okay, show okay, my screen. Okay, we've made the presenter. Can you see now? Is it there now? I just did exactly the same stuff as we did during the practice. And yeah, yesterday. unfortunately, we're still not seeing your screen. Uh, this That's is kind weird. of odd. Yes. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Sorry okay. about that. Here it is. It works now? Yeah, it works. Huh. We can see your slides full screen. Maybe it just took a minute. We were we were a little too impatient for it. <laughs> All right. So no problem. Take it away. Again. Yeah, sorry about this. Let's start again. Uh, so basically, it's a presentation from uh, some work that we've been doing with Dan Boya, with, with a PhD student from Mozambique working here. Um, so we, we've been working on searching, and searching has been like a fantastic model in the field of acidification with like hundreds of paper published now. And, uh, and and what we you know we we've, we know for for a long time now is that we have a similar effect when you expose them to low pH and with cuttlefish. If you expose them to low pH, they, they grow slower. But we tried to go to get a little bit uh, to the next level and, and studied why they were growing slower. And we've been studying a bunch of different things like acid base regulation in larvae, feeding rates, maintenance, and so on. And to cut a long story short, what's happening is that if you expose a serotonin larvae to low pH. Uh, the, the, there is a reorganization of the energy budget. So in, in a control condition, in a high pH, they use some energy for maintenance, they use some energy for calcification, and whatever is left, they use it for growth. When you expose them to, to a lower pH in the ocean acidification context, they have access to the same amount of energy, but they need more energy for maintenance, they need more energy for pH regulation and digestion, and the, the energy they need for calcification is the same. But overall, they have less energy available for growth, and that's why they grow slower. However, most of the studies that have been done, if not all of them on sea urchin larvae, are ignoring the natural present variability. And, and we all know now that most of the early work has been done with the open ocean thinking, the way, where conditions are really stable, and then we expect just a shift from 8.1 to 7.7. .7. But if you work on coastal organisms, like most of us do, there is a lot of fluctuation there, uh, and this fluctuation has a critical role in, in uh, predicting biological response and needs to be taken into account. And, and even the fluctuation in itself can have a biological response, and you start to have papers now published showing that if you expose organisms to fluctuating conditions, you have different responses than if you expose them to control con to con some conditions. So in that context, we decided to see if the natural variety created by the ecosystem have an impact on, on, on some of the local here uh, calcifiers? And if yes, how that, was that working at the physiological level? So what we did is took the, take the context that is really big in Sweden about the ecosystem restoration as an adaptation strategy to OA, and in particular, seagrass. So there are a lot of program here where we, replant, we are replanting seagrass beds that have been destroyed for a while. It's really important because it's increasing the biodiversity, increasing resilience of the ecosystems around, and it's also a really great uh, capture, way to capture carbon. But if you introduce such an ecosystem, you're going to create fluctuation because during the day, you're going to have life, photosynthesis, and respiration imbalance, and overall, you're going to have an increase in pH and an increase in oxygen. When during the night, you only have respiration and you have a decrease in oxygen and a decrease in pH and an increase in... Uh, in CO2. So you're going to have these fluctuations. And we were interested to see how this fluctuation will impact uh, some of the local calcifier. And we were we focused on sea urchin because we know so much about them, because they are really important locally here, and also because they are very responsive to their environment. So what we did is that we exposed sea urchin larvae to variability created by uh, the, the seagrass beds. And we wanted to see how they were adapting their calcification rates and what kind of cost could be associated to this. So the design was relatively simple. We had some aquarium with just flowing water directly from the fjord. We had water and sediment, so these were all controls. And then in some of the aquariums, we also added seagrass in density that is uh, relevant for what we have around here. Of course, everything was uh, truly replicated. So it was naturally flowing, floating, flowing water. And then we had light with the 12-12 uh, cycles or like a 
After that, we were taking a bunch of different measurements. So we were measuring uh, continuously the carbonate chemistry together with temperature salinity and so on. And this is how the experimental uh, system looked like. So you can see some of the aquarium have seagrasses, some other ones don't. And then what we did is use the water from these different aquarium and exposed sea urchin larvae to them. So we collected the local urchins, Echinus esculentus, spawned them, collected eggs and sperm. And just before they start building the skeleton, we were transferring them in bottles with the water from the aquarium system. And we were changing the water uh, every uh, 12 hours to, uh, so they had water from the night and water from the day. And we could actually see if there was a difference in their physiological response. And to do that, we were measuring a bunch of different things like survival rate by measuring density, measuring size, morphometrics, and so on. But we were also uh, using a proxy for calcification. So we were basically taking the larvae, squash them under uh, on, on the glass slides, and then under the microscope, have pictures like the one you can see on the screen right now. And, and basically, we could measure all the calcifying uh, place, uh, skeleton in here, and, and have an estimation of net calcification, right? because we could compare that what happened over the last 12 hours. You can measure calcification rates every 12 hours during the experiment. I don't have all the data analyzed yet, uh, but I, what I will show you is the preliminary data from uh, the seven first days and only for the treatment where we had control water. But we also did the experiment by manipulating the water with two different uh, PCO2 that are higher. Uh, but that will be for the next time. But basically, if you check the chemistry in the aquarium, as expected, if you add sea grasses, you're going to have fluctuations. So you can see in blue, this is the control water. We've had sea grass and the pH is relatively constant. If you, if you have uh, sea grass, you can see that during the night, pH goes down. During the day, pH goes up as a product because of photosynthesis. So exactly what was expected. More interesting, we could actually check, is there an impact on growth? If we compare uh, the growth of the larvae in either constant or fluctuating water, and the answer is no. Actually, you can see here the graph showing the relationship between size and time, and there is absolutely no difference after seven days. We have one more week of data, so we'll see if it's stable over 14 days, but it seems that the growth is exactly the same. But the most interesting part was checking the calcification. So you can see here uh, calcification through time. So you over the first seven days and you can see net calcification. So basically if it goes up, that means it's calcifying. And if it's lower than zero, it's, it's dissolving. And what is interesting is that you can see a very clear fluctuation that is present both in the constant treatment in blue and in the orange treatment, which is the fluctuating conditions with the seagrass water. So basically what does that does tell us is that even when the water is constant, the larvae are fluctuating their calcification rate. So during the day, they are calcifying more than during the night. And this pattern is amplified when you uh, expose them to fluctuating water. So it seems that they are expecting fluctuation. So they are anticipating fluctuation and, fluctu and calcify more when the conditions in the water are better for calcification, so during the day, and they go down during the night. So it's a nice adaptation to fluctuation. But, and this is amplified when you expose them to fluctuating conditions uh, due to, to, the, to the seagrass. And you can see that actually it goes into dissolution during the night. So they dissolve, recalcify, dissolve, recalcify. And of course, there will be a cost for that. So in a way, it's, it's really nice because it's a demonstration that marine calcifiers can adapt and anticipate fluctuation. And that's something that you can actually clearly see here. And that, that actually can help them to cope with fluctuation. But under like low pH condition that you can expect in the future. So you're going to have an amplification of this fluctuating water and very likely that will be associated with, with higher costs. So that's more or less the data I have for the moment, but it's very likely that we, when we analyze all the data, we're going to have a little bit more information about the long-term exposure. You know, we have seven days of data. We're going to have two weeks. And also uh, we're going to see what's happening when you expose them to, to high CO2 fluctuation that's amplifying this fluctuation. So in conclusion, there is an adaptation to fluctuation. Seagrass is creating fluctuation and gonna, uh, is amplif amplifying this variability. Uh, so very likely it's going to have costs that hopefully we're going to identify in the next presentation or next time I, I can talk to you about it. So I'll try to present that in Peru next year. So thanks a lot for your attention and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much for that, Sam.
Uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker now, Kelsey Archer Barnhill. Kelsey, I've made you the presenter. And before Kelsey gets started, I just want to remind the audience that if you have any questions, that please post those uh, in the questions box or type them up on Twitter using the hashtag OAWeek2020. Kelsey, it looks like your presentation is full screen. Um, take it away. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelsey Archer Barnhill, and I am a first year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. I will be presenting work that's been previously done that was led by my supervising team, um, consisting of Dr. Uva Wolfram, Murray Roberts, and Sebastian Hunnigan. And this will be focused on ocean acidification impacts on framework forming cold water corals. All right, so here we have a photo of a cold water coral reef. And now these are biodiversity hotspots in the deep sea. And this is an image of a healthy reef ecosystem that is present in aragonite uh, saturated water. So here, this has an aragonite saturation of 1.1, and this is a healthy reef system located in the Southern California Bight. So currently, 5%, there's only 5% of cold water corals that live below this aragonite saturation horizon of 1. And deep sea ecosystems, like these cold water coral reefs, are classified as vulnerable marine ecosystems, which are threatened by ocean acidification. However, with ocean, with ocean acidification, now the ash is shoaling, and so we, the predictions are currently that by the end of the century, over 70% of cold water coral reefs will be in undersaturated under waters in regards to aragonite um, due to up to 2,000 meters of shoaling. So what does this mean for our reef futures? Well, in this image, you can see high 3D complexity of this reef system. However, once we go to aragonite saturation of below one, that's where we're going to be seeing um, a change in the reef structure. So you can see lots of white in this image, and that's all live Lophelia pertusa. However, what is missing in this photo, which was present in the previous one, is that three-dimensional structural complexity of the dead coral framework. And now the dead coral framework is actually quite important. A lot of the research has been done on live corals. However, it is actually the transition zone where there is a mix of dead corals, mostly dominated with dead coral, and there's also a presence of some live coral where we see the highest levels of biodiversity on these deep sea reefs. And these, a lot of studies that have been done have focused on live coral. And there's been done over a range of times as well, um, ranging anywhere from the impacts of ocean acidification that was a 12 hour exposure to a one year exposure. So when you go ahead and look at the trends within these studies, you go ahead and notice that there's a change between the long term and the short term studies. So here, in regards to calcification rates of cold water corals when exposed to lower pH conditions, we see that in the long term, there's actually no significant impact on calcification rates, despite if you look up towards the top of the screen, seeing that the short term experiments would make um, could make you think that, yes, there will be a negative impact on these cold water corals at, at their calcification. So this really drives home needing to look at this at a long term scale. A similar trend is um, you can see for respiration rates as well. However, what is interesting is that in the only long-term study to be done, which was led by my supervisory team, um, you actually see that there is a significant impact in the long term, and that is with porosity, and that's on the dead coral reef skeleton, which again is really important for this biodiversity framework. So this work was done um, in a long-term laboratory experiment where corals were exposed to 750 and 1,000 ppm CO2 for one year. And at the end of this, um, how, how was porosity quantified? And that was done by synchrotron imaging. So you can see here um, the rotation of two coralites. And on the left, that is one coral that was covered with live tissue and on and live protective tissue and on the right that is a dead coral which did not have that tissue covering it and then it's calcium carbonate 
skeleton was exposed to these corrosive waters. And this same trend was found not only in laboratory results, but also in field results when samples were taken above and below the aragonite saturation horizon in the Southern California Bight. Another image from these synchrotrons where we're going to be looking at a cross section. You can see a live coral skeleton on the left and that dead skeleton again on the right. And you'll see around the edges, there is porosity occurring, um, which can look like little pitting or just that ring around the edge uh, where it's no longer completely solid, getting um, dissolution and porosity marks. This is seen not just in synchrotron imaging, but also here in backscattered electron emissions. This is, again, a sample of Lophelia pertusa um, in aragonite saturation less than one. In the upper left hand, again, you see that same trend where there is no dissolution occurring to live coral. However, once that coral skeleton is exposed underneath, then you're going to see that pitting and porosity and dissolution occurring. Now, this also occurs when you look at electron backscatter diffraction. Um, here you can see the bright colors show crystal organization and orientation and of the calcification areas. And then the darker areas where you can see there's higher CO2, uh, that happens when there's dis decreased diffraction. And the color here means high diffraction and identifiable crystal orientation. Additionally, when you're looking at this scale, there is a decreased molecular bond length of when you were looking at high CO2 conditions. So overall, looking at this from different scales in the electron backscatter diffraction as well as in synchrotron imaging, this has impact, of course, not just on this micro scale, but on the reef level scale. And this is seen, uh, this is coming up from a new paper, which is currently in press. Um, it will be out in Frontiers, a little sneak peek. And um, this shows that there's a trend overall where the habitats above the aragonite saturation really provide this suitable habitat. It's a functional reef, and you're going to be seeing that high biodiversity. And once that coral, that dead coral skeleton, is exposed below the aragonite saturation, the 3D structural complexity is lost, and it no longer um, is projected to no longer support such high biodiverse ecosystems. So looking at this, once a coral gets, once a coral reef comes below the aragonite saturation, um, we're going to go ahead and no longer classify this as a functional reef. So in the middle, we have a functional reef, and this is where there is a high proportion of dead to alive framework. Um, you need that 3D structural complexity, but you also need the live Lophelia pertusa or another framework forming species to really go ahead and make that be a functional reef. So go, moving forward from what is known onto what I hope to do in my PhD is go ahead and fill in this black box model. So this is thinking if we know the current reef condition and we know how corals, uh, both dead and alive, will react to future conditions, can we go ahead and put in the current health as well as the projections to what this reef location will look like at the end of century and then be able to say which scale, which uh, reef functional number uh, will this reef be by the end of the century? And so some of the outstanding questions that remain is what is the dead cold water coral skeletal porosity extent at different IPCC projections, as well as the impact that multiple drivers will have, as well as the current conditions of reef, and what will these conditions be like in the future? So for my PhD, I will be doing an experimental design, which is looking at the impact of ocean acidification in single stressor experiments with dead corals, as well as multiple stressors and, and deoxygenization on live and dead corals. So this includes, this will be the first long-term one-year study that looks at the triple stressor impacts and can see how ocean acidification will impact cold water coral reefs when combined with increased temperature and deoxygenization. This will be done by repeated CT scans of the coral skeleton to go ahead and fill in work that's already been done. We know the porosity extent at certain aragonite saturations, I hope to fill in the blanks as well as be able to look at when this onset occurs. Um, in the previous study, it was just uh, scanned and imaged at the end of full, full year. So the repeated scans every two to three months will go ahead and be able to really set the time scale and be able to look at the trend. Additionally, live coral samples 
will also be studied. Um, they will be scanned and then they will also be looking at respiration, buoyant weight, and something new, which will be 360 degree photography. And this will be to look at tissue retraction. This is a new method that will be developed. So if anyone has any comments or any experience, I'd love to chat with you about that. Finally, I will be adapting a method used by Joanna Vad, where I will be taking ROV footage and looking at the proportion of dead to alive restructure and combining this with the biogeochemical uh, current and modern day parameters at the site and then being able to assess reef health. And combined with the long-term experimental conditions, hope to be able to predict the Atlantic cold water coral future. Thank you so much to my supervisors and other collaborators involved in this work. Thank you for listening, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions at the end of this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Uh, and as she said, uh, if you have any questions, uh, all of our speakers will be able to answer them. Uh, just type them into the questions box, or you can post them on Twitter using the hashtag OAWeek2020. At this time, I'll introduce the next speaker, Jason Hall Spencer. Jason, I've now made you the presenter. Try sharing your screen. That work? Yes. We can see you. We can see your screen. OK. Can you see this? Oops, sorry. We can right, see your on the screen. Side. Yes, full screen. Take it away. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for everyone attending this uh, online conference. So um, this is a piece of work we haven't published yet, although we've um, submitted the paper. Um, it's, it's a collaboration that, that's going between um, my colleagues in Japan and some in Italy. And so the first author there is Silvan Agostini. And he um, discovered some carbon dioxide seeps um, off an island called Shikini in Japan. And I've got a, um, a research professorship um, out at Scuba University who funded this work. So um, we decided as a group that we don't really like the term tropicalization that um, some marine ecologists have started using to describe the ways in which coastal communities change um, due to warming. And I'll, um, I'll explain why we don't really like that, that term. But in a nutshell, what we're finding is when you combine warming with ocean acidification, it leads to a simplification of um, coastal ecosystems. Well, this, this train of thought, this, um, this area of research basically came out of a workshop that I helped run in Plymouth. So that's the um, Marine Biology Association in the background there. And a group of people that um, were experts in seagrasses, microalgae and seaweeds and we pulled our expertise to try to see what was going to happen to the flora of the um, Northeast Atlantic due to warming and acidification. We took a fairly simplistic approach um, using average um, aragonite saturation levels. And up, I'll try and use a pointer. This green line shows the average aragonite saturation of, of two, and it moves right south down to um, to Galicia over the course of this century um, because of, um, of ocean acidification, reducing the amount of aragonite in the water. And the colours in the background, the pinks and the, the reds, are showing the amount of warming that's predicted in sea surface temperature. And the little cartoons in the background are showing um, where there's merl beds, which are, I've got a piece here, hopefully you can see it on the camera. They're a, a bit like coral, to be honest. They're very hard and twee, but they're seaweeds radium calcium carbonate, and both the living and dead reefs that they form are very important for biodiversity. So they sh are shown in pink um, on the map. Then there's kelp forest and also seagrass beds. And we looked at those main habitat formers. Here's a cartoon of what we predict to happen uh, in the south of um, the European Union. Um, basically on the left there, you've got a picture of a kelp. Those kelp forests are actually dying at the moment around um, Portugal and Spain, and even into France. They're dying off because of um, too much warm water. And on the right-hand side, you see pictures of the organisms we think are going to survive well going into the future. So in the southern region, uh, we think there's going to be enough aragonite in the water 
um, to allow male beds to persist, to, per to persist. And so the male beds we think will be fine. And we actually also think that the Zoster and Marina seagrass beds will be very, do very well because of the extra carbon dioxide in the water um, boosting their photosynthesis. So with the loss of the kelp forest, we think some um, invasive species will start to proliferate. Um, these are species that actually originate from Japan. Things like cowlerpa and asparagopsis um, are likely to spread as the colder water fucoids and kelps uh, suffer in the south. So this is making the point really that major biogeographic shifts are underway at the moment because of warming. And we're interested in how um, ocean acidification is gonna affect that process. Now, a good place to do this is at a major biogeographic divide, which you see in um, Japan, because the north of Japan is very cold with kelp forests. The south of Japan is very warm with coral reefs. And we're interested in the division between these two um, biogeographic um, boundaries. So in the north, um, they grow seaweed to eat. Um, that's Andaria or Wakami uh, growing in the north of Japan. And in the south, they've actually got really big uh, coral reefs, like in places like Okinawa. But here they're shown white because they've, they've been bleached by um, a, a, a sea heat wave. And these recent marine heat waves have actually caused devastation to the uh, coral reefs of Japan. 70% of the biggest coral reef uh, died in 2016 due to warming. Now, there's hope, um, widely held hope, that coral reefs will simply move northwards um, as waters warm. And so although you get the death of coral reefs in the south of Japan, or at low latitudes anywhere in the world, that those coral reefs might move north. So we've started to investigate this using carbon dioxide seeps. This is a video um, I've pinched off uh, Katerina Fabricius from Papua New Guinea, from the videos taken in Papua New Guinea, showing carbon dioxide bubbles coming out through the seabed, affecting long-lived reef forming organisms um, with acidified water. Now, wherever you've got tectonic shifts, either that's continents coming together or spreading apart, you get carbon dioxide bubbling up to the seabed, providing us with natural laboratories to look at the effects of ocean acidification. This is a, an infographic from a paper we did just publish. Um, Carlo Catano is the first author from, um, from Palermo in Italy. And what the paper is showing is that as you go to areas with more and more CO2 in the water, you get habitat simplification. And that habitat simplification means there's fewer types of fish. So the weird thing about our study area in Japan is it has pre-industrial levels of carbon dioxide in the water. It's a bit complicated, the reasons why, but basically it's, it's influenced by the Kurashio current that has a lot of primary productivity in it that drives um, the CO2 um, levels up, sorry, down. Anyway, so you've got pre-industrial um, conditions with very strong and diverse uh, coral, coral reefs forming. But then as you go towards the, um, the, the CO2, where, where it's bubbling out of the seabed, you get fewer types of fish and weaker coral reefs. But this, the problem with these CO2 seep studies is that they very seldom include um, warming, which of course is happening at the same time as um, ocean acidification. So there's that Kurashio current bringing warm water from the south, um, from around Taiwan and uh, the Philippines. It flows up past the, the coast of Japan, and it means that offshore waters are a bit warmer year round than inshore waters. And that's shown on these uh, two, um, drawings of the Izu Peninsula, where we're working um, in Japan. Now there's an island um, site offshore with a cross there and an inshore site with a dot. Now on the left, you see um, the numbers of days in which water gets below 15 degrees centigrade. And on the right, it's showing you how many days of the year that gets above 28 degrees. And as Sam was saying earlier, this, this variability is very important in driving what can live where and what can survive well in different places. So the inshore site, just to reiterate, is on average um, colder, whereas the offshore site is on average warmer. And we're using that uh, as a way of looking into the future of what's going to happen around the Izu Peninsula. And we've also got a CO2 seep system there, so we can combine future warming conditions with future CO2 conditions. Now, when we transplanted kelp forests, from our present day to the offshore site, 
what we found is literally overnight, they were eaten up by um, tropical fish. So these tropical herbivorous fish really munch straight right the way through the kelp. We did this several times at different times of the year, and the same thing happens. They really do decimate the kelps that we transplanted there. We also transplanted colder water corals, the types that occur on our inshore site, out to the, um, the island where there's CO2 seeps. And we did it in control areas as well, where there was just warmer water, but no um, high CO2. And interestingly, these, um, these hardy northern coral types had no significant effect on their survival or their growth um, when we transplanted them at different times of year. But when we did the transplant experiments using the tropical corals that occur in the south of Japan, we saw very major effects. Uh, in fact, these, these corals just can't cope with um, the cooling uh, of the conditions or with the raising of the, the, the CO2. So they're especially vulnerable to ocean acidification. But we think that's going to stop them completely in their tracks as um, it, and that they can't colonize further north in Japan because of ocean acidification effects. So I'm just finishing off with a few slides here to show you what the underwater uh, coasts look like. This is our cold water site with plenty of kelp. Um, unfortunately, that kelp has died at the offshore site. It's died in the last 20 years and it's it's cause problems for the fishermen because the fishermen like to catch things that live in the kelp forests. What they've got there now is the gradual spread of these table corals, the acroporids, um, and of course the disappearance of the kelp. But at the high CO2 site, you don't see tropicalization because basically there's no corals there and there's no um, kelp there. So this is a, a, a habitat dominated by um, turf algae with very little associated uh, biodiversity, especially low numbers of uh, calcified organisms. So just to finish off, this is um, a, a slide taken from, from a report basically saying that we're in the middle of a global uh, crisis in terms of biodiversity, and I, I think our study absolutely confirms that, um, that coral reefs can't move further north um, as because ocean acidification stops that by geographic shift. So that's that's me, and I look forward to answering questions later. Thank you very much, Jason, for that presentation. At this point, I'd like to introduce our last speaker of the day, Silvana Birchenoff. Thank you. Silvana, mm -hmm. I have now made you the presenter. Go ahead and you very much. share your screen. Can you see okay? Yes, it's full screen. It looks great. Take it away. Super, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, everybody, if you are in the other side of the Atlantic. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you about um, a study that was funded by our government. This is a collaboration between CFAS, but also um, colleagues from Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Julia Artioli has been working with us, a combination of ecologists, fishery scientists, but also modelers. And this is really important to set the context because it is something we have been developed in collaboration with our economists as well. So not only looking at what are the responses of commercial species, but actually how we bring the evidence and the information we acquire from experiments and how are we able to understand this into a, a scaling up a type of um, approach, but also as well, how do we bring this to regional impacts? So in terms of setting up the context for this work, um, again, we're trying to understand what are the um, implications and how experiments can help us to understand fully what is the mean some responses of a species. We know that from experiment evidence, we know that some species will be more affected by pH than other species. We've seen already results from physiological responses, exposures and adaptive capacity. And we do know that from previous work, but also today as well, um, how pH levels change in naturally in many areas. But also we know that trends are changing, we know they're decreasing in some in specific sites, but also we need to understand and we need to really relate how the um, many studies on, on specific individuals actually can help us to to make predictions, but also to understand future management implications. And we do know that there are specific studies on commercial species, but also we want to really understand on, on a special level uh, what are the things that we need to uh, prepare ourselves better. In terms of the um, North Sea, I'm going to take you to the Greater North Sea. This is something that we have been looking and we've been following in, in the um, 
North Sea area between 0 to 20 meters. Some of the pH variability, as you can see here, some of the strengths actually are showing some variability in units. This is a, a synthesis that was done by several of us um, back in 2016. My, caller, my colleague um, Claire Ostel um, collated some of the synthesis of information and we're really starting to document what is the information we have available, but also what is the variability and how we see the changes. So we do see there is some variability and as, as we look into the full trend, we do see some specific changes towards the end of um, some of the years in the trend. So, but what does it all mean and why is it really important? And here we see the distribution of shellfish in England and Wales. To the left, we have the crustaceans. Um, also, for example, species like crabs, like lobsters, like shrimps, which are very important commercially. But also in the center, we see species like mollusks, so cockles, mussels, oysters, whelks. Uh, and as you see here, we do see a specific distribution uh, at the further diagram how species actually are being populated some of the inshore areas but also what does it all mean in terms of resourcing but also what does it mean um, when um, we have certain levels of pH variability and what does it really mean for, for shellfish and fisheries um, as you see here some of this this work is documented under the, the um, work that Mangi um, published in 2018 where we see the economic impacts but also this information also helps us to put things into wider context. So as I said before, we wanted to um, combine some of the experimental results. We wanted to look at pH projections to try to understand if commercial shellfish are already exposed to low pH, but also what is going to be the changes and the variability. And for that, we also looked at projections and how areas will be impacted in terms of geographical extent, but also the, um, the biological effects. In terms of that, what we have done, we use some of the recent uh, high resolution projections on pH from the Northwest European Shelf. Um, I do know that uh, Yuri's been um, updating some of this work, so this is um, slightly being edited at the moment. Uh, we are working in terms of looking at future projections of pH, but also based on a specific European projects. And as we have seen from previous um, European effort, the EPOCA work actually used a lot of the scenarios looking at control, medium and high pH um, um, values. What we have done also, we looked at uh, effect size on crustaceans and mollusks, and we looked at the variability, but also the different distribution across England and Wales. In terms of that, as I said before, uh, jury has been uh, looking at specific um, changes in pH and, and PCO2 projections, and I've just put here a, a snapshot of some of his previous modeling work, where he's looking through the different seasons, the this, this seasonality to look at what are the, the levels of, of change that we can observe. And you can see here between some of the top winter and spring diagrams that there is some kind of changes in some of these areas. And some of it is, is obviously influenced by um, environmental factors, but also biological activity. So as we know, processes and respiration of marine organisms will have some um, influence in some of these areas, as, as we see here in the, in the larger picture. In terms of this work, uh, this is a hydrodynamic um, ecosystem carbonate model, so it's the Polcom's ERSEM. Um, and what we're trying to do here, we're looking at some of these layers of variability. We're trying to take the absolute difference in surface pH, but also we have a specific time periods from the 2080s to the uh, 2099 compared to what we see at the moment. And we have looked at the, the A1B medium um, emission scenarios. So as I'm taking you through some of these changes, what we have done, we started to look at some of these changes. In blue here, primarily we see uh, the control um, pH levels that are, are being uh, modeled in some of the sites. As we go through the changes, we're starting to see in summaries specifically in the North Sea, primarily some changes in pH. So basically we're going from the control to the medium scenarios. So this is the, the 740, 750 ppm. But as we get to the end of the 2080, 2099, we're starting to see in some areas experiencing in the North Sea, but also in, in some of the more Celtic Sea and, and, and Southern um, Ireland, for example, experiencing changes in the variability of the pH. So we do see a medium to, to a high scenario. And, and as we see here, we oscillate, obviously, we're starting to see specific changes in some of these sites, which is really interesting because as we started to bring in some of our um, commercial species distribution, we do see a specific areas where some of our mollusks and primarily some of our um, crustaceans, so for example, in the south of Ireland, 
particularly the nephrops, nephrops norbergicus, um, are being affected by high levels of pH. But also we do see some, some changes in some medium levels across other areas. And we do see some of the south, but some of the, the more um, eastern side of the UK, we do have, as you see here in the diagram, some mollusks, some crustaceans. So there are some variabilities in some of, the, some of these areas. But also, as we started to look at this, as I said before, this work is coupled with some of the economic impacts of, of acidification we've done on shellfish and fisheries, but also we wanted to put things into wider context. So if, if mechanistic responses and changes are going to occur, what does it mean for the economy? What does it mean for our fisheries and aquaculture? So what we have done here, we review 11 experimental studies, mainly on, on commercial species. We use the, the log transformation response ratio, where we look at scenarios, we looked at the, the medium and the high. So in the context of the medium scenario, we look at changes in growth, for example. So a slower growth reduce, uh, reduces um, calcification. But also, what are the things that to do with other stressors, like, for example, increasing levels of vulnerability to temperature? And as we move on to the more higher scenarios, we look at changes which are associated with deformities, but also reduced survival, which are things that we have seen in some of the experimental evidence we've tested in, in the laboratory. So as we started to look at some of this, this overlay of information, what we see as we go to the, to the to kind of the end of the period we're looking at, some of the maximum extremes, we do see that in the south of Ireland, as I said before, the nephrops, which are the important commercial species here, crustaceans, they're big nephrops grounds in these areas in, um, in Ireland. We do see some type of deformities, but also the reduction in survival. And as we look at these um, challenges, these are important for, for understanding, but also for, for us to make the specific recommendations and management aspects of some of these areas. In other areas, of course, we do see some changes in terms of medium levels. We do see a slower growth responses, but also we do see some reduced calcification and some vulnerability to other stressors such as temperature. And this is really important because as we move through some of these scenarios, we do see a specific introduction. This is not something that happens immediately. Again, these are model um, layers of, of detail, but we do see some changes in some specific areas in the North Sea, for example. And this is really important because as we start to understand some of these responses and trying to bring the very detailed experimental evidence and trying to scale this up, we, we really need to understand which areas will experience some effect or minimum effect or, or little effect. And in some cases we do see um, some areas of the North Sea where we have a small, um, a little effect of commercial shellfish, but also some shelf areas as well as we see, for example, in the, the west coast of Great Britain and Ireland, we do have some projections that are, are have a tendency to show some specific effects such as deformities, but also reduction and survival, and some effects potentially that could impact our shellfish production. Now, again, as we know, some of these factors do not occur alone. We do have other things like temperature, but also food availability. We know that um, marine species have a very different dependency as they develop and reproduce, and we have different effects, for example, on survival when compared to other, other stresses. But when it comes to acidification, it's important that we actually get some of this understanding, but also put things into wider context. Why, why are we doing this and why are we trying to bring this together and why this is, is useful? Um, and one of the things we're trying to really understand is to provide the early warning understanding. What are the things that we can actually start to think about in terms of species response, but also environmental response? How we can bring things together to make sure that we can inform management, but also policy directions, and we can actually safeguard our shellfish and, and, and our resilience of our stocks as well. Um, we know that in some cases, several studies have also shown the abundant presence of food and good quality of food, and we, we've seen that ourselves in our own experiments, can actually counter effect the of pH. So this is something we are looking to refine as well, because not everything is black and white, that you 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 lower one effect and it'll be immediate another response. Things happen um, gradually in some of these environments, so it's something we're looking into it. But as well as that, we're looking at areas which are helpful for us to understand and monitor and provide some of this detailed understanding. And as I said before, this is the um, economic um, impact paper that we published recently as well, which it goes hand in hand and complementary to this model lean approach um, for commercial species. And with that, I thank you for your time and thank you for, for listening today. Any questions, please, I'm happy to respond. Thank you very much.
Thank you so very much, Silvana, for that presentation. Uh, at this time, I would invite all of the panelists to turn their cameras on, and uh, I will uh, share my screen. Thank you. Okay. So uh, first, I would like to thank all of our speakers for their great presentations. And uh, at this time, we'll begin the question and answer section of this session. Um, I'll remind the audience that they could type any of their questions into the questions box or post them on Twitter using the hashtag OAWeek2020. Um, I've also listed the, uh, the hashtag for the Northeast Atlantic Hub. Um, there's a bunch of questions that we've received, and we likely won't have time to go through all of them, um, which means that we'll continue the conversation on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. This is a social media platform specifically for OA researchers, OA policymakers, stakeholders, anyone interested in ocean acidification. Um, I'd encourage you to um, make an account on the OAIE if you don't have one already. And before we begin, I also would just like to bring the audience's audience attention to two of the other sessions we'll be having today. Um, in a couple hours, we'll be um, listening to the ninth session of Ocean Acidification Week. This is the Friends of Go On se session. We'll hear from other organizations that do ocean acidification related work and partner with Go On. And then finally, we'll have the capstone presentation which will feature the co-chairs from Go On, as well as the co-chair from the High CO2 Symposium that I mentioned earlier in the webinar. So I will now pull up some of the questions and then begin asking them to the panelists. Okay, so the first question is from uh, Katie Schamberger and it's directed towards uh, Kelsey. Katie asks uh, or states that she's very excited to check out the paper in press. She wanted to know about the porosity of the dead coral. Uh, was it uh, below the ASH compared to porosity of dead corals above the ASH? And she said that you showed an image of a live core of a live CWC above the ASH, but what do the dead uh, CWC skeletons look like? Sorry about that. There's a lot of yeah, abbreviations. So I don't know if you quite understand <laughs> the question. Yes, I, I know my CWC and A A S H. So um, <laughs> uh, yes. So great question. Thank you for that, Katie. Yes, so when this experiment was done, of course, we also had a control going on in the long term experiment. So the dead coral that was in the, um, the control did not see this porosity. And the same thing occurred in the um, when, when coral samples were collected above and below the ash, where cor dead corals above the ash did not see this um, dissolution. However, that is a good question, and um, I do wonder if it was leading on to the fact that you, you can also have bioerroders and bioerosion, and that does, it does look similar in the images, but we are able to distinguish between it. So there will be some cases where you do see some dissolution or, or not, well, yeah, you see porosity, but it's not caused directly from the uh, CO2 levels, however it is from, from a boring animal like a sponge or something similar. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And I appreciate the fact that you understood your abbreviations a little bit better than I did. Um, all right. This next question comes from Christian Vargas, and it's directed towards Eve. Uh, Christian wants to know why you chose the treatment levels that you did for your experiment. He mentioned specifically the 980 pCO2 level. Um, why was this level chosen? And did you think about exposing your uh, cuttlefish to um, a vari uh, natural variability in the experiment instead of keeping the levels constant? Um, yes, thank you for the question. So we chose those uh, levels for the high CO2 uh, level according to the um, 
to the, expect, the expected uh, levels for the end of the centuries. And we kept it constant. Um, I, and for that, I want to come with the question of Sam that he gave on the, in the comments why we didn't put uh, fluctuations on the, um, on the levels of, uh, of, uh, of pH. Well, it's, it's true that we, we couldn't. It would actually be uh, nice for further studies to include those fluctuations uh, since they are coming from estuaries. Uh, here we wanted to keep it simple as well, since it was um, already a bit complicated with all the, the feeding treatments and everything. We, don't, we didn't want to add um, um, some more uh, noise, I would say, in the, in the, in the data and the results. Uh, but yeah, indeed, it could um, change and it would be nice to have some more um, information about that in further studies with those fluctuations uh, in the shows. Great. Thank you so much, Eve. Um, this next question is for Sam Dupont. Uh, and uh, the question is, it has been suggested that kelp forests can act as a, uh, a sanctum or a sanctuary for calcifying biota. And do you consider such highly productive systems as these sanctuaries um, from the effects of OA? Or do you consider them as maybe exacerbating the effects because of the variability you see in pH? Well, in a way, that was the kind of question we tried to answer with our experiment. Is like, is it good or bad actually to be exposed to, to this fluctuation? Because during, during the day, it's kind of a refuge, but during the night, it can be worse. And, and uh, I don't have the answer yet, but it seems that you have this dissolution, increased dissolution during, during, during the night. So that might actually have a cost because if they have to dis dissolve and recalcify all the time and they are not adapted to that, that could be at a cost too. So I don't have the answer. And actually that's exactly why we did the experiment. So let, let's talk about that in, in a few months. And can I make a comment on, uh, because I, I think what, what Christian meant was not really if you include variability, but more if you, uh, why, why didn't you use like a lower uh, value? Because uh, the, it's true that is the PCO2 for, for the, the end of the century, but on the other hand, it's not the PCO2 they are exposed, I mean, they will be exposed in the future. It's probably already within the natural range of variability. So that my comment was also that what you see might not be a response to OA, but more a response to, you know, the natural variability and then some plasticity. So I think that's what Christian meant. So why didn't you go lower in your treatment? Um, yeah, well, it's true that we cannot rule out the, the plasticity on, the, um, on, on, on this, but, well, it's a good question. Like, we just wanted to keep it with the, the levels that are expected. Um, because when we went on the, um, at the place to, to collect the, the eggs, we actually measured the pH and it was around 8.1. Uh, and yeah, other colleagues uh, at other times found already lower pH, but we wanted to keep it. So with the 8.1 that we found when we went and um, the values expected for, for later. One question that came in um, from Muhammad Asraf asks, uh, is there any portal um, that contains protocols for conducting OA experiments on organisms? Um, and is there a portal for the data that comes out of those experiments? Uh, this question is for the, anyone. The yeah, for, for the data, okay. actually, the, the OAICC on, on their website is collecting the bio, at least as much as they can data on the biological response. So you can go on the OAICC website to have a look at the data. Now for the best practices for biological response, you have a little bit of that in the Oceanification Best Practice Guide, but it's kind of the, the basics in some, in some for some of those. But you, you, you can, I'm sure the on, on, on the on the information exchange, you, you can definitely find some, some support that will guide you to, you know, protocols and, and, and find help. And you also have the peer-to-peer -peer program. So if you're a start, if you're starting, please join the peer-to-peer -peer program and you're going to have people who can direct you to, to the right uh, information. Silvana, it looked like you had something to add. 
No, I was just going to say similar to what Sam was saying, but also I think the, the community is very friendly as well. So I don't see a problem why people would not email you directly and ask you as well. Um, I have done the same in the past with Sam, with Steve, um, with Jason as well, asking specific questions about pH analysis, samples, and people do tend to be quite friendly and open about the work because it's quite nice that a lot of us that have done experiments, we do know where he's been trial and tested and what works and doesn't work. So anybody, don't be afraid to ask, just send us an email and we're all happy to help. And if we don't know specifically, we will get you in contact with somebody who can help you. Simple as that, I really. I agree. And again, check the check the OAICC where you have like updates about what, what's happening in the field. And and I was I'm, I'm going to organize a, a basic training. Actually, it was supposed to be this year, but because of COVID-19, it's going to be uh, postponed to next year. So keep your eyes open on, on the OAICC. There will be uh, information about future training where you, you can actually come to Sweden or other places and, and get basic trainings on, on biology and chemistry. Well, that kind of leads into our next question, actually, um, which is how COVID-19 has impacted uh, your your research. Um, I could imagine that um, you, if while you were in quarantine or in lockdown, you couldn't really go into your lab. Um, so does anyone want to speak a little bit about their experience? Shall I start? I mean, for us, it's, sorry, for us, it's been uh, a phase. Uh, uh, stage, I guess. Some of the areas where we sample directly, we obviously have to stop. But having said that, I think um, a lot of us have taken advantage of being at home and looking at a lot of data sets and doing a lot of planning and a lot of analysis, which has also been a, a very fruitful um, way to advance, I think. Um, but equally, I think some of us as well that are collaborating, the, the papers, the experiments, the planning, the discussion has still continued, perhaps not as active, active as we would like to in the lab. Um, in some cases, uh, for example, my student that works with us doing experiments on, on, on fish at the moment with, with uh, pH and temperature and oxygen just came back to the lab last week. So slowly we're starting to pick things up. Of course, um, elements of health and safety are, are key here, uh, but it's slowly but surely I think we will be, we'll be back on track um, as well. Thanks, Silvana. I think Kelsey had something to say. Sorry. Yes, I just wanted to add in that I, my research has been delayed from COVID-19. I was supposed to be starting my, well, I was supposed to be getting my corals in April and then starting my experimentation shortly after that. Um, my, so the corals that I'll be doing my long-term experiments on, they've been collected and they're currently sitting in um, Sharno Marine Station in uh, Sweden waiting for me. So I'll be um, coming to pick them up in October and then very excited to get to work and very happy that um, the people there have continued to look after them on my behalf. I, I was just going to say that for me, I, I found it an incredible um, experience that we could actually still communicate with each other and still work with each other internationally so very effectively. And um, in doing so, of course, we're not emitting so much CO2. So um, that's what this yes. been a lesson for me, at least, that we can still um, operate efficiently as scientists internationally without having to get together face to face so often. And as someone, or as an, as I think, a community that uh, that that is intimately uh, involved with the understanding that uh, greenhouse gas emissions impact ocean acidification. Uh, I think we're all probably pretty cognizant of how much we used to travel compared to how much we're traveling now. So uh, I think it's good to hear that there's some silver linings um, in all of this. Uh, Helen, Eve, Sam, anything to add? I, I can say for, for me, it's interesting because I've been doing a lot of capacity building over the last six, seven years. And, and when you travel and see that people actually don't have access to fancy labs in many parts of the world and want to do some acidification research. And, and for me, what was interesting is that this year I've been put in the same situation. So I had to close my lab for a few months, so I, I had no access. So I tried to find other ways of actually doing science, which was fun and, and it was possible. I mean, you, you can dig into the literature and test new hypotheses. And with Christian Vargas, who has the first question, We've been working for, for years on, on reanalyzing the literature to test new hypotheses. So they, that was a nice way that, you know, you, you can still do, a good, do good science without producing necessarily data from, from, from experiments. 
in in my side i would just everything has been said as well around like um that it was actually a good opportunity to just go in data and there is always ways to contact other people we were actually lucky i would say that in the time that uh, the country just uh, went into lockdown in march we didn't have much go going on or at least we were not at the point of having the animals in the in the facility so it was fine and now we are starting as well like for a few few months now uh, to go back to work but with um rules and not as many people neither so like all work that can be uh, done in the computer are still doing at home and but we are still trying to go step by step back to the lab with limited amount of people and then yeah it just asks for a lot of um of adaptation as well to go by shifts not be too many and things like that but yeah it's going i'll just uh, finish that off i suppose by saying that it's been a great opportunity for me to really dig into getting getting the hub up and running again we kind of got very busy in the lab and that prevented some of the activities from going ahead um although COVID has obviously prevented some of the face-to-face -face meetings. We've been able to do a lot of communication online and that's um, really been great for, for planning and taking things forward. Um, but yeah, it's it's a difficult one. A lot of the observations actually um, in situ have still been um, ongoing, which is fantastic. A lot of people have still been doing their best to get out on ships um, where they can. Um, so data measurements are still being taken um, so hopefully that all feeds in in the long run to understanding and as Silvana and many of the others have spoken about scaling up what we learn from experiments single species or single lab experiments to actually be able to um, produce models <coughs> excuse me produce models and make future projections and really get to grips with understanding how we can uh, use the information that's coming out of all these different types of, of data so Thank you all for uh, for answering that. Uh, and then another question that I'd like to pose to the entire panel um, is actually a, a question that I asked the uh, the earlier uh, Northeast Atlantic Hub session, um, and it has to do with early career scientists. And I think because we have an early career si a couple early career scientists on the call right now, it might be a good one. Um, how can early career researchers become involved in the field of OA? So maybe if you're an undergrad. Um, or, or even earlier, uh, what kind of things you need to do to kind of get into this field? I can answer that, like, um, at least for now, for my part. <laughs> uh, in my side, so I, I graduated from my master two years ago, uh, so I'm still a newbie in everything. <laughs> uh, I'm applying for the PhD now, uh, so I'm just um, a research fellow. And I got into OA by actually looking for internships. So during my master, I had an internship to, to do for half a year. And so I was looking for that. I'm actually um, firstly from Belgium and now I'm living in Portugal. So I just, uh, I just got my internship in Portugal and I stayed there. Now I'm, I'm working here and living here. Portugal is nice. Good choice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But I was going to say, um, in our case, um, well, CIFAS has a series of relationships with uh, academic universities, but also uh, in our own benefits, quite a lot of the work we do is apply science. So in some cases, it's experiments. In other cases, it's using the information to provide advice. Um, in this case, for example, we are working closely, um, drafting documents. Um, Sam, myself, Steve Whittacom are looking at drafting a, a chapter which is uh, feeding through um, OSPAR which is the the Oslo Paris uh, Commission um, so again I think we're just trying to bring opportunities and I think working with students as I said before um, I think everybody that works in this field understands the challenges of field work money funding so I would say to early career scientists don't be afraid send us an email there is always opportunities whether it's laboratory or whether it's data analysis um, from my own experiences um, at the moment, for example, working in um, in Belize, I've been doing a lot of training and giving presentations to people at the University of Belize, uh, getting students to be interested in the topic, but also finding more about it. Um, again, 
just don't be afraid to ask and and, and send those emails and and just send those questions around so people will will inform me what is available and again some of these great um opportunities are good to actually discuss but also see what is what is available thank you kelsey i, I want to give you the on that as a oh. Go for it. Yes, so um, as an early career scientist, um, I can add on and say that for me, um, it's just the fact that you're here, you're coming to these sorts of events is already such a great sign. And to just let people know that this is what you want to do. Um, from the time I was an undergraduate, I knew I wanted to look at climate change impacts on the deep sea. And I didn't know how to get there. The deep sea just seemed so out of reach. But I made sure to tell everyone that that's what I wanted to do. I'd tell my, my professors, I'd go up to them after class and say, I'm really interested in the deep sea. Do you do any work there? Uh, do you need a, a volunteer to help out in your lab? And that's how I found out about an internship with Ocean Exploration Trust to go out to sea and sail on EV Nautilus. And uh, through that, um, I was able to gain more experience and uh, then found a master's and a PhD program that really did allow me to continue onto that path. And for me, it was all just about networking and letting people know that, hey, I'm interested and I'm prepared to do the work and then following through and, and doing that work. But there's absolutely opportunities and you just have to be driven and keep going for it. And again, everyone's nice. So send, send out those cold emails. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, Helen, uh, you were about to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight again that joining the hub or, or go on itself, um, or if you're in the Northeast Atlantic area, then joining this hub, you'll hear about opportunities, hopefully, as our website gets developed and also through social media, we'll try and share all these things. Again, the Oceanosphere Edification Information Exchange is a fantastic place to learn about opportunities, research cruises. Um, quite often you have extra spaces for early career scientists that want to get on board. Um, they they often get publicised on those sort of um, platforms. So yeah, like the others have said, we have a very friendly bunch. Generally, um, just get in touch. Enthusiasm is a lot more difficult to come by than being able to teach someone how to research. So if you have the enthusiasm, then we can teach you how to be a researcher. Um, so just just get in touch, like the others have said. Jason and then Sam. Um, yeah, well, I, I work at a university with this stacks of people coming through the system and some of whom uh, are like Kelsey, who are really proactive and um, put themselves out there and tell you what they want to do. And that's the way to, I, I second what she said, really. That's the way to, to progress and get your foot in the door um, if you want to be a researcher on any aspect, um, be it ocean acidification or anything else that's important to you. If you find it important yourself, you're going to do the work that's needed to succeed. So. Um, that's my advice, really. I, I never had a plan, so I'm not sure if I am a guy with a, a good advice, but I would say like it worked for me, it worked by hard work and luck. You know, you have to be at the right place at the right time. Sometimes I get my, I always tell the story to, you know, I got my job here because I had a beer at a conference with the right person. You know, I decided to go out for a drink instead of practicing my talk and I met the person who changed my life and became my mentor. And so, you know, that, that's how it works. You have to be, you have to be proactive. You have to hard work, work hard and, and be lucky. Well, and, not hesitate to, <laughs> and not hesitate to contact the people. Like it's really, yeah. Silvana. No, I was going to say you have to be lucky, but also drink beer and be sociable. Because again, taking the message from Kelsey, which I love the fact that she's proactive and she tells people, I think this is this is when you do science, the more you communicate, whether it's a research idea, whatever that might be. I always like the fact that students do come in with a very um, series of questions and eventually you discuss and you start shaping the question. And I think that's that's the starting point. Just just come forward and ask, I think. Definitely. And uh, although uh, we're not going to conferences right now. I hope that there are plenty of early career, career researchers on this call. Um, and although, depending on where you live, it might not quite be safe to go to a bar, at least without a mask, but um, wear a mask and uh, find those opportunities um, to network uh, in person or, or in the time being, virtually. Um, I think 
Uh, it's been said a couple times that the people on this call and all the speakers of OA Week are, are a friendly bunch. So even if you wanted to do a, uh, a call or a video call, I'm sure many of them would be open to, to doing that with you. So um, we're just about out of time. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists today one last time for their wonderful presentations. Um, we are um, coming towards the end of Ocean Acidification Week. We only have two sessions left. Um, and this means uh, that uh, they will uh, be happening in a couple hours. That means uh, the Friends of Go On session and the Capstone session. To continue the conversation with the Northeast Atlantic Hub, check out uh, the posts that I'm going to create on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. And for more details about logging on to the last two sessions of OA Week, go on to the goon.org website. All right. Thank you all very much, and uh, we'll see you at the next session. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.